Save big money on Clearview Cabinetry. Clearview Cabinetry starts as a kitchen built for now and grows with you as life changes. It's flexible by design with full access cabinet construction. So you can go from doors to drawers for storage that works when you need it. Explore Clearview's cabinet options in store and on Menards.com and save big money today. Big buys, big savings. Check out more of our great deals going on now at Menards. Save big money at Menards. The friendship is sharing deal. Because I want one of your McNuggets. And I need some of your quarter pounder. There's a deal for everyone at McDonald's. Get one favorite like 10-piece chicken McNuggets, a quarter pounder, or a Big Mac and get another for just a buck. Price and participation may vary. Valid for item of equal or lesser value. This is Ben from Hudson. Get exclusive podcasts and more at patreon.com slash partners in crime. Crime. Media. Just like I do. I'm Kevin Flynn, and this is Crime Writers On. Crime Writers On is the original true crime review podcast that digs into true crime, pop culture, other podcasts, and this week, an inside look at the investigation into a string of murders that terrorized California. We'll talk about Netflix's Night Stalker, The Hunt for a Serial Killer. Then, he's the gentleman burglar looking to clear his father's name in a jewel heist. We'll review the French-language drama Lupin. Joining me to get that done is true crime author, former defense investigator, licensed private investigator, certified cat lady, and pet detective, Lara Bricker. Hello, Lara. Hello, an amateur bird watcher. I'm going to add that to my list of things. Wow. Can you be a professional bird watcher? Can people pay you for that? Well, apparently there's a bird watching group in our state on Facebook that is a little intense. So I don't know if I want to be a professional bird watcher, but I, I, I enjoy doing it to pass the time during COVID. <laughs> Someone so aligned with cats, I would the birds should not be trusting you. Yes. Well, I'm on the other side of the glass, though, Kevin. Okay. And I'm like, here's some food. Come a little closer. <laughs> and also joining us, our captain of woke cynicism, the author behind the noir novels. Actually, that means he wrote them. Uh, the, no- the novels known as the City Trilogy, host of the Strange Arrivals podcast, and our Patreon book club host, Toby Ball. Hello, Toby. Bonjour, Kevin. Uh, Rebecca is not here. She literally just texted me, oh... I'm so upset, I can't tape, I'm sorry. She's actually right now on a train out of town with a bag full of her... No, I'm just kidding. She, she's with not feeling By the time you hear this, she is long gone. <laughs> this is how we're breaking it to America. I'm sorry, it just didn't work out. Yeah, she, she was... We, we, about an hour before we started recording, she became very ill. And so instead of depriving uh, America and the English-speaking world of another edition of Crime Writers On... I said, you know, this show's really about me anyway, so how about I go ahead and take over? Nice. And you guys were okay with that. Cool. All right. So, because I'm just going by the script and <laughs> I don't really know uh, you know, how to start bantering with you guys, usually I just kind of nod along. I can, I can tell you some banter, Kevin. Okay, we can yes. Follow, uh, so, on my bird watching exploits now. So, we, we're really um, going to do this, huh? We're really going to do the bird watching thing? Kevin. I have a red-bellied woodpecker coming to my what? house now. Yes, What's it's his very name? exciting. Uh, well, it doesn't stick it's around not long Ken. enough. No, it's not Ken. It's not Ken the woodpecker. <laughs> I also might have the hobo Americans living in the woods behind my house. Whoa. Okay, that's some news. You have yeah. actual. You can't call them. Uh, you, you know, tramps. You can't call them hobos. They are hobo Americans. Yeah. So here's the scene. So I was like walking out in the woods behind my house and there's like an actual like TP lean to like very elaborate that has been built in the woods. And I was like, oh, it must be we have our neighbor Nick at the top of the hill and he actually owns these woods. So I said it must be his little kid who's out there with his babysitter. And so he came down the other day because one of my deliveries went to his house. I said, oh, did did you make that fort in the woods? And he's like, No. And I'm like, who? So in in concert with this, so we have this mystery fort in the woods. One loaf of bread completely vanished from my house last week. Whoa. Did you leave a sweet potato pile cooling on the the windowsill? No, but also a container of trail mix disappeared. So two items of food 
Fort in the woods, not built by the kids at the top of the hill. Toby, I think so- those might be stoner Americans. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> They're stealing my bread. So stay tuned. I might put my game camera on Ooh, this fort yeah, in the woods yeah. to find out who these hobo Americans are. I can't believe you haven't already done that. Well, I've been, we have a fox that's been coming through that I'm really interested in. So I've been moving it around, keeping tabs on the fox lately. <laughs> it's not going to be nearly as fascinating as what you find in that TP. <laughs> Toby, some people will go to great lengths just to steal Wi-Fi. Yeah, that could be. I find out next week, I guess. Okay, I'll take a picture tomorrow when I'm out there. So, I mean, it's pretty elaborate, so <laughs> stay tuned. All okay, right. hobo Americans, let's get to this. Leading off. She turned around, and there was the male suspect with a stargaze look with a gun stretched out coming towards her face, and she put her hands up, and, and he pulled the trigger. Los Angeles police are baffled by a series of seemingly unconnected rapes, child molestations, and murders where the perpetrator broke into the victim's homes. Rookie homicide detective Gil Carrillo ties the crime sprees together through ballistics and a distinctive shoe print found at the crime scenes. That Avia was a very uncommon shoe. It wasn't like at the time an Adidas or Puma or or Nike even back then. It had just started manufacturing. In just over one year, the so-called Night Stalker killed more than a dozen people and raped and beat several more. Carrillo and his partner Frank Salerno looked for a break in the case while the L.A. media will stop at nothing to tell the story. I said, Frank, what about the shoe print I understand you've got? I said, what shoe? She says, the Avia. I said, okay, here we go. The Netflix series Night Stalker, The Hunt for a Serial Killer, recalls the investigation from the point of view of the lead detectives, along with reporters, victims, and their family members. The series largely removes Richard Ramirez from the frame, focusing instead on the crimes and those affected by the case. Now, spoiler alert, we're going to be talking about plot points from Night Stalker. So if you want to remain spoiler free, go to the estimated time code in our show notes. Okay, so uh, one of the things that this does, uh, Laura, is that it it takes the Night Stalker himself, Richard Ramirez, doesn't really focus on him at all. Uh, I I think this is a conscious decision by the filmmakers to not, quote unquote, glorify the serial killer. So can you do this? Can you tell the story without the killer? Yeah. So, you know, that's an interesting question because they did do it that way. And there was a lot of focus. I mean, this was basically told as I would call it like a straight police procedural for the first three episodes through the eyes of these two main investigators, the victims in the case, other police investigators and, and crime scene people that were involved in the case and the family members of those those lead investigators in terms of, you know, we have the wife of Gil who's talking about, you know, never seeing him. He's working like 20 hours a day and not sleeping. And so I thought that was interesting, but I also wanted, personally, I wanted a little more information about the background of the killer just because I was kind of curious, like, where did he come from? What 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 happened? And I and I understand it was a decision to tell it in this way. And and it, it and if that was the mission to shed light on the way the investigation played out, I mean it was extremely thorough. It had a lot of information and it covered all. It did drag a little bit, I think, because of that. Because uh, you know, for for a period of time, I feel like in the first two episodes, a lot of you know, it was like just one murder to the next, and it was almost hard to keep them straight for a while because just there were so many, I think. I don't know if anyone else had that problem. Toby, I have a note from you saying that you thought there were three things that were interesting about this documentary. You want to go over those? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think to your first point about can you tell this without really focusing on Richard Ramirez, and I, and I, I think you could, and I think you'd do a good one. I'm not sure this is it. And I think they make some weird choices along the way, which I think we'll talk about in a minute. But the things that I thought were interesting about this, because I, I, in general, did not like it. One is this sort of idea that Gil comes up with, like, actually the right solution fairly early on is that this one person is both, you know, killing all these people and not not killing people who fit a profile, but just like kind of just randomly killing whoever's there. It is also abducting and, and sexually abusing these children. And so his theory that it's one and the same person and people are like, no, that's not the way it works. 
And I thought that was kind of an interesting thing because, again, this this sort of idea that you can always profile somebody really effectively and stuff. And it kind of shows the limits of using what's happened in the past to inform what you're doing in the present. So that, so that was kind of interesting. And it also, you know, I thought was sort of more insightful about him than a lot of the other stuff that they did, which is that he, you know, he had the courage of his convictions in that case to kind of fight off ridicule and stick with his position or whatever. And then um, his partner saw it. So a second thing I thought was kind of interesting was just the fact that in the end, it's two kids who who basically are the keys to this thing. There's a one kid who catches the partial plate number and describes the car. That's like their first big thing. And then the second thing is the little girl who picks him out of the lineup. That's one of the, I don't know, a funny scenes, but where she's like, do I write down the, you know, the number two or do I spell it, you know, or the word two? So the, the whole the whole angle that the kids are so critical in this in a way that adults were unable to be helpful, I thought was interesting. And then the final scene, which I think kind of, oh, it's not the final scene, but, but, but sort of the way it ends uh, for Ramirez and the way he's caught is really pretty wild. Uh, and this idea that his picture and name are put in all the L.A. papers and they're worried that he's going to see it and escape. But in fact, he's coming back from El Paso, has no idea. That Which this is, is really surprising, Toby, because we find out through the thing that he follows the case very closely. Yeah. So if he had taken that bus trip the day before or the day later, he would have seen all the coverage and not and just, just not come home. He was almost like in a, a, a time capsule stuck on a bus while all this was going right. on. Right. And with no smartphone. Um, You're right. So anyway, the, the whole scene where he like shows up and then suddenly like literally anybody could recognize him and he gets recognized and goes on this crazy like foot chase uh, and he's eventually, you know, captured by citizens. It's like hard to believe, but I guess it, that's what happened. People are starting to turn around and look and point and talk. It's him. It's him. So he jumps off the bus. And what he didn't know was the gentleman that phoned in and flagged down a truck from the gas company and said, hey, killer's on that bus, follow that bus. And the chase was on. That is about it for positive things that I will say about this. I thought otherwise it was it was pretty poor. I think it's, you know, set up like a, a more traditional, conventional true crime story where, you know, it's told chronologically. It, it's also, it also relies very heavily on the recollections of the investigators who tell the story. We saw a little bit of this in in the Ripper, but primarily in this, we're really leaning on the recollections of two cops. We haven't had a lot of these kinds of situations to talk about since George Floyd and sort of this reexamining of like, well, should we take at face value everything a cop says in these true crime stories? So we we have to first deal with this idea that are we comfortable that the story is really being told? To some extent, by other folks, we have, of course, the family members of victims talking about that side of things. But the whole narrative about the investigation has to come from the cops because, you know, it's hunt for a serial killer. The people who hunt the serial killer are the cops. And I think each of them are interesting in their own way. But as far as if I think if you are a viewer and you're just going to it's just disqualifying for you, anything that just sort of isn't going to challenge these officers on the inequities in the criminal justice system as part of this story, then you're going to be disappointed because that's not the way one can tell this story, I think. There are a lot of different ways to tell it, but I was pretty comfortable and I thought it was the obvious choice, maybe not a terribly creative choice, but the obvious choice to go with Gil, especially Gil, as the rookie cop, as, as opposed to starting off with you know, Frank, who's the star cop. It's much more interesting to hear Gil kind of come up and idolize Frank and then him tagging along as they try to try to solve this. Both get a drink at the bar, and he says, Hey, Gil, I don't know if you'd be interested in working with me. Too cool Carrillo, you know. So I said, Yeah, I'll give it some thought. And I went back, and I sat next to my wife, and I said, Frank Salerno just asked me to be his partner. He goes, Frank Salerno, he's the best up there. But as far as the idea of are we all okay with the idea that the you know the story was told by a not doing a lot to uh, glorify Richard Ramirez, but puts a lot of the spotlight on the work of these police officers who actually aren't afraid to say like where things got screwed up and don't just do the party line. Laura, let me start with you. Are you okay with that, or is that a problem for you? 
Well, it's interesting that you bring this up because, you know, this is sort of the format when we were doing true crime books like 10, 12, 15 years ago. This was Mm -hmm. the format they wanted the books told in. And that's how I told my book. I had a lead investigator who also was a rookie cop and that was, you know, and he was willing to cooperate. So that was the point of view. But I think the point where it kind of bothered me in this one wasn't even necessarily the two main protagonists. It was that that one guy who managed to get Ramirez's name. And oh, he's yeah. telling like this story of he's like, tell me the fucking truth or whatever he was doing. you know. And I was like, the way that he was telling the story of how he got the name of Ramirez out of the other guy who was the boyfriend of that woman who came forward – I was like, you know what? That type of story, it's like he was out back with all the old cops having a few beers and they're like, yeah, remember when we did that? But it wasn't necessarily, I didn't feel like appropriate in this time to to recount it in that way. I, I don't know if I'm describing that correctly, but I just felt yeah. like I was like, yeah, yeah, that was a little, mm. <laughs> Right. And, and, and just as a reminder, what it was, it was a cop from San Francisco who yeah. got Ramirez's name by punching this guy in the face. And I struck a short jab. It wasn't my best punch, but it definitely wasn't my worst. He touches his cheek. Is that as hard as you can hit? I looked at him and I flashed back on the crime scenes. The pans, the vomit, the masturbation. And I said, pretty boy, I'm gonna split you from the top of your head to your ass. Toby, I know you had issues with that too, right? Yeah, I mean, it's well, I, I think it's like this is the most obvious case of it, where he's like, "Yeah, I punched him once in the face," and he was like trying to act tough, and then I said, "I'm gonna like fucking put my fist through your," you know, it was like sort of the tough cop thing. Like, I don't necessarily have a hard time having Gil and uh, and Frank's voices. There's just there's just very little other analysis of what happened. Because I think it, it it's a little hard to tell, but I, I think you could pretty easily make a, a series, which is like, why did it take these guys so long to figure this out? You know, it, it, it seems like there was like some bumbling and, you know, oh, they put a panic button in the, in the dentist office and it didn't work. There was just really nobody to say these, like some mistakes were made or, you know, it's mostly... When they're talking about how things get kind of screwed up, it's Diane Feinstein came out and, you know, said this, <laughs> or they couldn't wire the panic button, or so it's always like something they else left is the going car on. In the sun, that, yeah, and they they the car, and never, you know, yeah, yeah, never did the fingerprints, yeah, yeah. So it's you know it's all these things, and and there's nobody who says, look, it took a long time. There's a lot of people being killed, and people are like what's going on here? You don't, with all these murders, you don't have enough forensic evidence to figure this out. And, and, you know, it may legitimately be that they did everything that could humanly be done, but there's no context because it's just them talking about it. And then the people who are, the media people are like surprisingly not very insightful. You know, it's mostly just kind of their stories like, oh, I went here and oh, mm-hmm. we went, we, you yeah. know, we went on the airplane and we saw the cops. And we're like, we're in the right place. I um, like that story. I'm sorry. It, no, it's a, it's a, it's a <laughs> fine story, but it's like, did you like, while you were reporting this, did you have any opinions about how things were going? See, I liked that the part, uh, you know, maybe as a you know reporter myself, I liked that they didn't use the reporters as substitute historian, you know, talking heads. Usually we have, we bring in the reporter. It's because to fill in the blank about what happened. As opposed to, okay, the reason that they're here is not to just fill in the the blanks and because somebody else didn't tell part of the story, but to talk about their um, issues and their experiences covering the case and how it dovetails with what the cops were doing. But, Laura, you know, we, when we talk about the Ripper, the Yorkshire Ripper killed almost as many people, I think, as the Night Stalker. But in the Yorkshire Ripper's case, that was over what, like five, six years? This was 14 months. Yeah. This was, it was like sometimes two attacks on the same night. I mean, uh, when you say it took a long time, that's a long time, but that's like a millisecond in a lot of these serial killer cases, right? Yeah, I was, the time frame was very quick. And that was the thing, you know, and I said it sort of like blended together the way that the story was told. But the fact that it was happening as quickly as it was happening, I think 
in the way that the story was told could have opened it up to a way to like add more suspense to the storytelling. And I felt that I felt like the same thing. I felt like that Rebecca and I both had issues with the Ripper. It just, I didn't feel the suspense as they were recounting this case. So I was like, he had a lot of victims, but it was just this like straightforward with these two cops sitting in this weird bar recounting the story didn't necessarily, for me anyway, sort of convey that it was happening in this really short time period. And it was happening. I mean, the only part that I really felt that with was describing when Gil wasn't sleeping and he had been up all night and he went home and his wife was like, you need to go to sleep for half an hour or whatever it was. And he got called right back out for another murder. Yeah. So I think that time period, I think if they had, I mean, maybe, I don't know. I think it was just the way that it was told that wasn't as apparent to me as I think it should have been. Sometimes I, I you know, doing this podcast, I get my head into the uh, the role of different production people on, this, on set. And I kept thinking about the location manager for this documentary who had to find bars in Los Angeles and say, hey, you're pretty much closed from 4 a.m. until, you know, from sunrise until happy hour, right? Can we just shoot all day with a cop, (laughs) you know, up against the bar and an empty shot glass there while he tells of, his, you know, his uh, hunt? The glory days. Yeah, the glory days. (laughs) You know, not since uh, the legend of Cocaine Island have I been so distracted by, you know, the noir settings that they put their subjects in. Well, the thing that I don't know about you guys, but like I never would have recognized that second detective, oh, Frank. Frank, yeah. Frank. Like from the pictures that we saw and the video that we saw during the investigation. And then we see him now. I'm like, are you sure that's the same person? Uh, did you guys have that reaction? Yeah, I 100% did. Because <laughs> yeah, when they first show it, he's with a couple of other people. And I was like, okay, which one's him? <laughs> um, you know, Gil. <laughs> Gil yeah, looks, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, Gil's got a look. They both look a little better, though. I think they've ate, they both have grown oh, into they, their yeah, look, you know? 100%. Oh, even yeah. Frank, yeah. Yeah. They, they've aged well. <laughs> Kudos. Can we, can we talk about Kudos. the um, use of the crime scene photos? Because if there's one thing that I've heard a lot of that people are not comfortable with the graphic nature or the, or the amount of or the use of the crime scene photos as a, you know, a true crime author, my tolerance for that is a little higher than the average person, but I would have to say that, well, I think I would have made some different choices with the explicit nature of that. Anybody else feel the same way? Toby, how about you? Yeah, I thought it was a little bit much. And by that, I mean kind of a lot bit much. <laughs> like in the end, like what what was their point, right? If there, if there was something that they were trying to show with those, it just kind of seemed kind of lurid and, and sensationalist. And then they do this weird thing where sometimes they have it recreated, right? So that it mm-hmm. fits in with these weird, like they'd go into these sort of amber or sepia toned. Like animations, little, yeah. Little things where you're in this house and there's like a fan going and you go down the hall. And then you see like the leg in the same position that you saw the leg in the. So it's like they're actually having people recreate these crime scenes for these sort of stylized weird things. I, yeah, I thought it was a little bit much. And I I think my sense is, is that when people are sort of turn their nose up at true crime, a lot of it is this memory of these like 1980s, like at Walden books, like these like Jeffrey Dahmer, cannibal killer, like black front with like red, blood red, written in blood stuff and a couple of grainy photos on the, and they're just like, hey, these we really don't get quick. to pick our covers, Toby. Come on now. Yeah. Don't be a snob. <laughs> I'm not being a snob. I'm telling you my, my impression <laughs> of people's impressions, but that I think what, like a lot of the best stuff that we've reviewed, if they're showing crime scene pictures, it's usually for a reason other than to be like, this is some bloody shit. Like, check this out. There's, there's a lot of blood and here's this body. But in this case, there didn't seem to be any other reason. Yeah. There was no other kind of talk about it. And not not even, like, I even go back to the Ripper, where they were talking about how he was displaying his victims. And that was one way they knew that it was, like, the same person, even though a lot of time had, had passed. But they weren't showing you the actual, like, as explicit the, of, of the pictures. So, Yeah, whole dead I, I body, but it. with that little black line over the eyes. Yeah. Like a 1970s porno film or something like that. Yeah, it's like that again, doesn't do yeah, anything. It's just, it's, it's just 
it's lurid. Yeah. You know, it's it's just really, it was weird. And Toby's right. The best stuff is sort of elevated true crime from above that. And Laura, what, what's your take, though, on the production value here? Not only the graphic crime photos, but it also, I think Toby's right, there's like... A, this uh, weird mashup of different production styles between the archival stuff, the interviews, you know, sort of the animations, the art around the the crime photos, and then the drone shots. It just seems like a lot of different things. Yeah. But tell me about the crime photos first, and then your other thoughts. Yeah, no, the crime photos, I mean, I, you know, the thing about the crime photos, because I had heard that before we started watching this, that people were like, it was like unnecessarily graphic. So I kind of went into it with an eye towards that, thinking, okay, what, what's going on here? But, you know, if they were going out of their way not to shed the spotlight on Ramirez, not to make him the focal point of the story. But then on the flip side, they're showing these extremely graphic crime scene photos, showing blood all over the place and people in various states of, you know, where they were when they were found deceased in the crime scene. That didn't really gel for me. I was like, so we're not highlighting Ramirez, but we're going to look at this poor, like, elderly woman and then they give this extremely graphic description of what happened to her and here she is laying on the floor or whatever i don't know i i I feel like the argument for including that was they really wanted to illustrate just how abhorrent these crimes were and the I mean, these these were really violent really evil you know compared to other things that we've reviewed in terms of serial killer cases. I mean, this was a really horrific killing spree in terms of the people that were killed, how they were killed, how they were tortured. So I I, I think, you know, that the argument, you know, in terms of including that was we want to make sure people understand just how bad this was. But it was it was pretty graphic. Um, and but I, I mean, I have like Kevin, I definitely have a higher tolerance than than most people, I think, for that. So I was just like, well, you know, at, at some point you've just become accustomed to seeing the, I mean, I've seen autopsy photos and things. So it's like those things, um, you know, you become accustomed to when you do that a lot. But, you know, the different production styles, I mean, it was you're right. I mean, I think that, you know, we had all these random bar scenes with with the people being interviewed and then the mashup of the older scenes. It, it was OK. Yeah. But I think overall, I just didn't really love this documentary. So <laughs> and <laughs> and what totally we really loved was all these scenes of the two guys driving around together. Yeah, like after looking all really these years. Yeah, kind of intense. What do you guys? What do you guys do in your spare time? Ah, we just we drive around. Well, the sun's out. We in sit a car. in a bar, and then when well, the sun yeah. goes down, we drive around the mean we streets. Get freaking loaded. <laughs> hey, Go for at, a ride. at least they didn't order the fake like McDonald's to recreate the scene. Oh man. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, then let's do what Rebecca usually makes us do. Let's That's right. Give our uh, spoiler full reviews of Night Stalker. The Hunt for a Serial Killer. Laura Bricker, we're going to start with you. What did you think? Thumbs up or thumbs down? So I really, really tried to give this documentary a chance. But honestly, it was really hard for me to finish it because I just, I really didn't like it. I I, I did not find it engaging. I found it hard to get into. I just, I didn't find like the story was told for me anyway, at least in a compelling manner where I I learned something or I came away away with a different perspective about the crime. I'm going to tell you, the best part for me was the old lady that had the giant heart glasses on who I don't remember her uh, gave I would like to say the best quote of the entire documentary when she was discussing these women when Ramirez uh, was on trial the women that all wanted to like marry him and you know have sex with him and she said I'm sorry but I think they're the dumbest bitches ever (laughs) And, (laughs) and she had these big heart glasses on and I was like that's the only time that I was like ah um, so I, I don't know. There's plenty of other documentaries out there. And if you want to learn about this case, I'm sure there's like dozens of true crime books at this point on this case. So I just really I, I didn't find this to be a very compelling documentary. Toby Ball, thumbs up or thumbs down for Night Stalker? Yeah, I I really didn't think this was very good at all. Um, you know, one thing we we didn't talk about in the main review, but which I think is sort of like a hole in it, is that I can see not wanting to put Ramirez as a, in the center of it, right? It's more about the investigation, about the people doing the investigation, stuff like that. But what they do put of him in there is so poorly done, I think. Like, they play these weird snippets from 
this interview he did, and you're not really clear what's going on, like whether it's his voice or somebody, an actor is reading his stuff until kind of the end, but it's not very illuminating stuff. It's just stuff that kind of sounds weird. And then you have other people kind of saying, you know, I was in the presence of evil, but there's never any sense of like who he was or, or why he did what he did other than a brief thing about our horrific upbringing. So, you know, I can see not wanting to place him in the center of it, but I think you've got to do a little bit more than what they did. Cause in the end, like he's the guy that this is all about. So, you know, that's just another of my many problems with this. Uh, I give it a pretty hearty thumbs down. I just, it's just pretty poor. I'm going to go with a tepid thumbs up. Um, I thought it got better as it went along. I agree, though, that it has a lot of structural problems. Certainly the production stuff, I think, th- think the choices there were kind of troubling. And uh, while they're trying to be tasteful by not focusing on the killer himself, some of the other choices were just a little tasteless. I did like uh, Gil and Frank. I thought that they uh, were an interesting pair. That's the kind of uh, law enforcement stories that I like to hear about. You know, guys that are working very hard to get it right and uh, are interesting in their own story. So uh, his talking about his family life and the rough effects of having to live with a serial killer hunt day after day. Uh, that was interesting. We've heard these things before, so it's not really terribly enlightening. But as far as a you know tr- true crime story, you know it'll do. Uh, Rebecca Lavoie uh, just texted in that she is thumbs up for Night Stalker, and especially loved how he was arrested and caught, which blew her mind. And now, folks, because Rebecca isn't here, we're going to have a very awkward transition into a commercial. Do you ever meet someone who seems kind of off? Whether it's a creepy neighbor or random phone number that keeps calling you, Truthfinder has you covered. You can search for people by name, address, phone number, email, and more. Truthfinder can be especially helpful for running confidential background checks on anyone you're planning to meet from online dating apps. Go to truthfinder.com slash podcasts for a special offer. That's truthfinder.com slash podcasts to access your special offer today. Hey, honey, how was your trip to Menards? Awesome. The Menards bag sale is back. Oh, uh, what's the bag sale? You grab a bag in store and save 15% on everything you can fit in the bag. I got a new cordless drill, LED bulbs to help with the electric bill, stocked up on toothpaste, always need batteries, and paint for the mudroom, plus all my favorite snacks. Uh, where are you going? Menards, we're out of cleaning supplies. Hurry in. Grab a bag in store now through January 14th. Get 15% off everything you can fit in the bag. See store for complete details. The friendship is sharing deal. Because I want one of your McNuggets. And I need some of your quarter pounder. There's a deal for everyone at McDonald's. Get one favorite like 10-piece chicken McNuggets, a quarter pounder, or a Big Mac and get another for just a buck. Price and participation may vary. Valid for item of equal or lesser value. It's business time, Toby Ball, Laura Bricker. How about that music? Oh, yeah, it's their groove. By the way, in case you don't know, the music gets added later, so we don't really hear anything. Not to pull the curtain too far back and ruin everything for you. I don't even know what the music is. (laughs) Toby hasn't listened to this podcast since 2017. (laughs) We took the Amazon list out, and he's like, I I did it once. I'm sure it was okay. I listen to parts sometimes, but the business section is not usually like, I wonder how that went. Damn, folks, if you listen this long, you're, you're in it for the business section, I, too. I listen, and I even listen to our Patreon stuff, and, like, Married with Podcast has some, like, sexy music on it. We do. It's we like, get bow, the... chicka, bow music, yeah. Well, if you want to listen to the latest episode of Married with Podcast, that's available right now on Patreon, and later this week, we're going to have another episode of Toby Ball's Deep Dive Book Club Podcast, and, well, you have 50% of the panel is right here in this podcast, Tell us about your um, discussion of The Feather Thief. Well, it was uh, Laura Bricker, as people probably guessed, was there. Um, And then uh, Elise McGovern, who is a criminologist from Australia. And Nigel Poor from Ear Hustle. We had a really nice discussion about The Feather Thief, which is a... It's like kind of a, it's lighter than the usual deep dive fare, but it's it's basically about a young flautist who... uh, steals some rare birds to feed his fly tying obsession 
It's a great it high story. It I is. have read the book too. Yeah. And I think yeah, I think it was really good. And there's also a lot about sort of like these crazy explorations like in the late eighteen hundreds where they would just go and collect like tens of thousands of specimens of stuff and put them into trunks and send them back to England and Unless your ship just, sank Oh, yeah, well. or yes. caught on fire. And caught on fire. <laughs> caught on fire, sank with all your stuff, and oh, then you shit. had to go into a uh, into a lifeboat and eat raw pork uh, <laughs> until you got picked up by a lumber ship after eating through all their raw pork <laughs> rations. So anyway, yeah, it was it's it's a fun book. Uh, we had a fun discussion, and uh, so it should be out fairly soon, I guess. Mm-hmm. And uh, for this week's Patreon patron saints, we want to thank Mike Loomer. And because I have to have a Jennifer every week, uh, Jennifer G.G. Neely, bless you. These are two great. I, these were, I had great conversations with these folks. Uh, uh, G.G. is a really interesting person, a former journalist, PR expert, and adjunct faculty member. And she is a supporter at the $25 level on Patreon. So that means she gets to watch and take part in the recordings of uh, Toby Ball's Deep Dive Book Club. Wow. And Mike Loomer is our friend who is a uh, a behind the scenes guy on movies and TV, and I can't say the production that he's working on right now, but it has sex in the title. Oh, I, wow. I don't know. Look at Toby's face. Have a lot of... Oh my God! Look at Toby's face. <laughs> <laughs> what he's told me though. Look into it. <laughs> yeah, apparently there's not a lot of sex actually in the show, but. You know, uh, false advertising, I guess. That's funny. And thus concludes the business section. Moving on. Ils mettent aux enchères la semaine prochaine. Pareil que ça va dépasser les 20 millions. This is the Queen's necklace. Milan to speak. Yeah. Next week it goes up for auction. Probably going to go for 200 million. Oh shit. It's okay. I'm sure you can afford it in a million years. A lowly janitor at the Louvre concocts a plan to steal Marie Antoinette's necklace with the help of a low-level drug gang. But this janitor is more than he seems. Hassan Diop is a con man who has fashioned himself after Arsène Lupin, a famous gentleman thief and master of disguise from French literature. He uses his extraordinary talent to commit his various larcenies. No obstacle can get in the way of his plans. But his greatest talent, without a doubt, is to always be one step ahead. The Queen's necklace vanished years ago from the home of Hassan's father's wealthy Parisian employer. Now Hassan uses the skills learned from his love of the Lupin books to weed out those he holds responsible. In Netflix's surprise French-language hit, Lupin, we follow the suave thief's attempt to stay ahead of both the cops and the criminal syndicate who want the necklace back. We're going to be talking about plot points from Lupin, so to remain spoiler-free, go to the estimated time code in our show notes to hear our reviews. Now, we also, I I mean, I don't know about you guys, but we have a a long-standing preference on this show for foreign language fair to uh, watch in the original language and uh, read the subtitles. Uh, Some of our listeners, uh, they, they... can't do that because you know, maybe problems with eyesight and reading and whatever. So you do you. But if you can't have the choice, I still recommend watching it in French. Lara Bricker, so what is your take on Asan, a.k.a. the modern day Lupin? I thought this was great. This was the most fun thing we have watched in so long. And I sat up here right where I'm sitting now in my little room of tranquility, and I watched it all in one day. It was like just a great kind of catch-me-as-you-can, smart, well-played caper story. We had a lot of great location porn in Paris, and, you know, we had a really charismatic lead actor playing the role of the gentleman burglar. And I just thought this was super fun. And, you know, with regard to your comment about watching it in the, you know, original language with the subtitles, yeah, I have to say that, for me, that's something I didn't used to like to do. But the longer we've been in pandemic times and the more that I find myself doom scrolling on my phone, even when I'm watching something, it's kind of nice to have to watch the TV show or the documentary or the series, whatever you're watching, and actually focus on it because you have to read the subtitles. Put your phone down, yeah. Put your phone down. It's kind of nice to just sit here. So this was a really fun 
thing to watch, I thought. Yeah. Yeah, I think you get a better sense of the actor's acting ability and their being in the scene when you, even if you don't understand the language, but to kind of get the um, all the accentuation on you know, the way that they're delivering their lines, nonetheless. Toby, before I ask you about the show, are you familiar with the character Arsene Lupin? Which I'm probably saying completely wrong, but... I'd heard of him. I didn't really know anything about him. Yeah. So to me, I find that this is a little surprising. This hit like number two trending on Netflix uh, the past week because it's it's a really interesting hook, but the gimmick is sort of like lost on American audiences if we'd not it's it's like if we never heard of Sherlock Holmes then right. CBS's elementary doesn't really play very well so but this is sort of you know this guy using him as, as this inspiration what did you think of that as sort of the uh, entry for this character uh that's an interesting question you know I thought it was I thought it was pretty good like that's not normally something that I'm drawn to in a show is like somebody like reenacts all the murders of the great serial killers or, you know, (laughs) stuff like that. Like that doesn't really usually grab my imagination, but the idea that he's like inspired by a guy who, you know, does capers, I guess. Uh, Again, I don't, I haven't read any of those books or whatever, but it seems like he's sort of a, a trickster and gentleman thief and all this stuff. So again, I, I mean, I think it, it kind of plays into this general sense of it being just sort of, it's a fun show. I mean, there's serious parts to it and stuff, but it's not, you know, even like the sort of tragic parts don't play as like the kind of thing that's going to make you wildly depressed or anything. I mean, they're just sort of plot points more than anything else, I thought. So, yeah. The the concept of the gentleman burglar is, I think, along this, this series of entertainment that we've had that focuses on con men as opposed to killers – uh, and that we've really enjoyed that in the podcast realm. And, you know, heist movies are fantastic. I mean, I think this kind of takes a little bit of Ocean's Eleven and Thomas Crown Affair and, like, those classic heist movies and mysteries. And who is this guy really? I think that's part of what makes it fun. Also, trying to figure out, like, you don't know right away. You think this guy's the janitor. You, you know, you're a hat. And then all of a sudden he shows up at this uh, auction as a you know a multi-millionaire and what is going on it takes a little while for that to come clear to the audience and i like that you just don't boom get all that exposition in five minutes and you realize you know oh there's a big plan going on here so i thought that that part of it was fun what do you think of our lead actor omar sai uh french actor the character uh, of uh asan is uh is, he's black he is a uh, immigrant i think from senegal yeah. That's what his family is. This wasn't a big part of the uh, the story, but to see a black character in Europe and sort of what that experience is like, you know, there wasn't a lot of sort of contrived quasi-racist things going on, but there'd be little things. Like when the guy from the Louvre kind of rolls his, not rolls his eyes, but kind of says, well, we didn't expect somebody like you. Says, what do you mean somebody like me? Or just the idea that, he can swap places with a guy in jail because the other guy is black and that nobody's mm-hmm. going to recognize him. Just like the rest of it, it's just done with a little panache. They didn't ignore that part of his character, but it didn't. Um, it wasn't performative. Laura, what did you think of uh, our, our lead? Yeah, oh, I thought he was great. I, I thought he was fantastic in the role and, like I said, very charismatic in the way that he portrayed that character. But... Like what you were talking about, there was like, you know, this was like definitely a fun, engaging watch, something kind of like a, you know, a quick bin, something that was entertaining. But underneath that, there was this sort of subtly done element of, you know, showing the racial bias in that society and that it wasn't in your face. You you know, it, it didn't take away from the caper portion of this story, but it's like, you know, you've got things like, when the wife of the bad guy, I can't remember his name, the guy that I hate, the guy who... Uh, Pellegrin. Pellegrin. Pellegrini. Pellegr- Pellegrini, sorry, yes. Okay, so the wife of uh, Pellegrini, when her car breaks down and she's out there in the pouring rain and we have our lead character and his father walking along and, and, and she like locks her doors because she sees like a black man walking along and, and he's like, no, I, I work for your husband, you know. And then even when we see our lead character planning the heist, at the Louvre. He's like, don't worry. 
they look at us, but they don't really see us. Basically saying, because we're all black and to them, we all look the same. So we can swap out people's ID cards and they're not even going to notice, you know. And then we also have the daughter, Pellegrini's daughter at the pool when when he goes out there, when he's a young, young boy. And she's like, so is it true what they say about the black men, you know, when he goes into the water? So I think it was meaning black guys can't swim. (laughs) Right. That was kind of the oh, I'm going to swim over to you. And she's like, yeah, basically saying, I don't think you can, because if you if you do, I'll give you a kiss. Yeah. But I don't think that. So yeah. it, it did it, it did come up. It did come up. Yeah. So it was but it was subtle. It, you know, you, you you know, when and when I finished, I was like, oh, there was this like subtle undercurrent here. And uh it wasn't done in such a way that that was like the central focus of the story and of the plot, but it was there. So our hero has to stay one step ahead of not only the uh the criminal syndicate that wants the necklace back, but also the cops who are investigating this brazen theft from the Louvre. That's how I say it, Louvre. Toby, what did you think of the what's going on with the cops and they're trying to piece together this idea that this criminal is somehow being inspired by the Lupin books? It's weird. The one guy like picks up on it immediately (laughs) and then it turns out he actually has a big Lupin shrine in his office at the police station. (laughs) Behind the secret doors? I mean, it's just, again, it's one of those things like, it's a fun show. Like, you're not you're not looking to say, is this realistic or not, right? So then there's like this whole thing where he's got this theory, which is clearly right, you know, as the audience that it's right. And you're, you're watching people sort of poo-poo it uh, and then sort of slowly come around to it. And then there's, you know, there's the uh, the commissioner who's sort of involved in all the shenanigans and, and he's trying to put them off the scent as well. So I, I think one of the things that the show could have done better is that you don't feel like he's really in danger from the police. Like there's not, there's not a sense like he's racing against time before the police catch him because the police don't seem like they're going to, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, it's, they're not close. So that, that, that to me, I, I felt like there's a few things about this where there could have been a lot more suspense and a lot more edge of your seat type stuff which is, you know, frequently a part of these caper things that for whatever reason they seem to sort of opt out of. There's this one episode where Hassan wants to talk to this convict because he feels that he has some information about his father. And so what he does to get to the prison to talk to him is he goes in and switches places with a convict and just takes over his place at the jail, uh, assuming no one will notice gets the information he needs, and then escapes jail by faking his uh, suicide and taking some pills to stop his heart and escaping from the ambulance. And I just want to know, why didn't he just (laughs) go and talk to the actual convict instead of talking to another prisoner and taking his place and doing all this stuff? I mean, I know, like, the guy's in the infirmary or some (laughs) stupid shit, but it seems like an awful hard way just to find out, do you have my dad's paperback book? Right, because he's super tricky. He's super tricky. Well, and also, I was kind of like, the thing that stuck with me from that initially was like, oh, they're not wearing like bright orange prison jumpsuits. They're all just wearing kind of normal clothes in this French prison. <laughs> like, I guess so. You know, like he went in and he was, he was, they didn't switch clothes in the interview room when he went in to get the other guy out. And I was like, oh, okay. Different kind of. I just leave my jacket. You go out with the jacket, it's fine. Yeah, different kind of prison scene. Okay. You know, I think the big the the big problem for me with this whole thing, in some ways, it feels like critiquing ice cream, right? Is mm-hmm. is you know, it's just kind of a fun thing, and, and and like you can go through it and enjoy it without thinking about it very much. But you know, I feel like these caper shows kind of rise and fall on the cleverness of the capers that are pulled off. And that was what really kind of seemed lacking to me uh, was that the capers, there's one where they're in the park and he's dressed up like a delivery man and he gets all these other delivery men to show up at the same time and they're all going all over the place and the it's cops like the don't know which is one. which. Yeah. Right. So it's like, all right, so in the Thomas Crown Affair, they did it. And it was like a little more clever because they were all dressed up weirdly, like Magritte's like guy with the with the bowler hat. Uh-huh. And then it was like again, there's like this true life sort of lame attempt at this that we got in the sneak. So it's like okay, so this one's been done before. 
but you're 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 pulling that one out again. The thing with getting out of the prison, there's a whole thing where he gets this basketball net. And he basically does it by jumping and grabbing it, and it comes right off, which is just not how a basketball net comes off. Like, I'm sorry, but, like, if that's part of your, like, devious plan, like, it's, it's got to be, like, you know, you just, He's like, make it. He's sleight of hand, man. We, we That was established. He could do that. He's and then, whooping. Yeah. Well, sometimes the sleight of hand stuff works. Like, there's one, there's, like, a scene where he pulls a uh, a pass key from a, a, a service worker at a hotel, and it's very slick. But the other thing is when, when he's stealing the necklace and he's like falling and he throws one necklace into a garbage can. He whips another necklace out of his pocket. <laughs> and it's like, th- like, seriously, this is like the best you could come up with, like how he's going to pull this thing off is he's going to throw one in the garbage and pull another one out from his pocket. Like it just, it seemed like there would be some like more creative, sort of more devious, less like counting on people not to be paying attention or things to happen in ways that they don't actually happen. So is that like little bit of cleverness and originality that I felt was kind of missing? I felt like I'd seen a lot of these caper things before. And that was what for me kind of kept it from being like, this is awesome. I love watching this because it was, it was missing that. And then it was missing this, like they're going to catch him if he doesn't get things done quickly. Like there wasn't that other kind of pressure where, he was just basically sitting back and kind of doing these things in his time. I think that the capers and the way that they were carried out were all based on the books. So that was already sort of predetermined. Mm. So he was basing the way that he was carrying out these heists based on the Lupin books, which are actual books ah. based on what I looked up. So They played basketball in France back then? I don't know. I don't know, Toby, but uh, yeah, so... Now, it's interesting. I, don't, I mean, maybe, pointer. maybe Thomas Crown stole the thing from uh, the Lupin book, but... Uh, yeah, who knows? But it did, from, from my perspective, it, without knowing those books, it was just like, oh, it's that thing where, the, where there's going to be a whole bunch of people who are dressed alike and they can't tell which is which. I and completely then, agree that like the what, supervisor's going to get all pissed off. Stupid, stupid. <laughs> you know, but I completely agree that what makes any kind of heist uh, show or movie has to be the quality of the heist and that we as the audience want to see them get away with it. It's a procedural in that way. We want to see the five steps it takes to steal a multi million dollar necklace from the Louvre probably more than five steps but that's that's what makes it entertaining and i think the only thing and laura as we know that they have left the the door open for a second season because they don't resolve all of the questions Mm -hmm. one of the big questions i have though and i want to see is sort of how did he get this good because we do have his his origin story which has to do with his father and his upbringing and how he meets his ex-wife but, you know, when we see him as an adult, he's already kind of um, sophisticated and, you know, as a uh, very good con man and pickpocket and whatnot. The one thing we don't kind of see is that jump. How did he get to be in this position where now he can emulate Lupin? Yeah, I think I think you're right, because I think we see a hint of the fact, you know, that he was not not always this good and this successful at doing this. When we have the flashback scenes and we see his wife and we see, you know, her talking to her therapist about, you know, he's not showing up, he's doing this, he's doing that, you don't want to know what he's doing. So you get the sense that he, you see that scene where he's in this closet with all these expensive suits and then he's dressed when he goes in to bid on this necklace. You get the sense when you later see the scene with the wife and her therapist that that was not always the case. And I think, you know, it sounds like there is a season two in the works. I, I saw something pop up today on something I was that, that it's, you know, been renewed for a second season here. So hopefully you'll find out because I, I don't know about you guys, but I liked the way that they flashed back and forth because it, it gave his backstory and added depth to the characters, but it also related to the mystery That was playing out with the necklace and avenging his father's death at the hands of what we come to believe is a fake heist by that Pellegrini guy. And I think that we have yet to see them resolve those two big storylines. I don't really know if the father has been avenged uh, yet. Uh, We'll have to see that wrap up. And of course, the other storyline, which is there, but I mean, so obvious is whether or not he gets back together with the ex-wife, which is really part of the whole raison d'etre, to use a French term. Uh, That's obviously part of what the story is. 
All right, so uh, why don't we do that thing that we do? Let's give our thumbs up or thumbs down reviews for Lupin on Netflix. Laura Bricker, thumbs up or thumbs down? Um, I'm going thumbs up with this. I, you know, this was just something that was like super fun to watch on the weekend. It was, what was it, like five or six episodes? And I sat down and started watching it in the afternoon. And I don't think I got up until I finished just because it was it was light. It was entertaining. I enjoyed the fact that I was watching it with subtitles, which allowed me to really sort of not do what I normally do and look at 10 of the things while I'm watching a show. Uh, but it was it was just fun. There was great location porn with the locations in Paris. And, you know, it wasn't perfect, but I just thought it was a really fun watch. Toby Ball, thumbs up or thumbs down for Lupin? Yeah, I'll give it a thumbs up, too. It, it was fun. Uh, I wish it had been better for the reasons I talked about earlier. But it's definitely, you know, things keep moving. Omar Sy is very sort of charismatic actor it's fun watching him do his thing so yeah you know a, a, a solid but not raving thumbs up i'm with both of you with thumbs up and for a lot of the same reasons i thought this was fun and light and obviously not rooted in reality at all some of the things that he's able to do as a master of disguise and you know really does something that in real life just couldn't happen and so you just have to kind of let that go and go along for the ride. Uh, you can be a uh, a bad guy or a knight, or you can be something in between so long as that you are a gentleman. And that's sort of uh, the theme here. So to have a uh, a light and fun and not malicious criminal, uh, that makes for really great storytelling. Rebecca Lavoy is also a thumbs up for Lupin. And now that she is not here, we're going to transition into a digitally inserted ad where she and I talk. So... <laughs> It's not going to be awkward at all. Roll that tape. Do you ever meet someone who seems kind of off? Whether it's a creepy neighbor or random phone number that keeps calling you, Truthfinder has you covered. You can search for people by name, address, phone number, email, and more. Truthfinder can be especially helpful for running confidential background checks on anyone you're planning to meet from online dating apps. Go to truthfinder.com slash podcasts for a special offer. That's truthfinder.com slash podcasts to access your special offer today. The friendship is sharing deal. Because I want one of your McNuggets. And I need some of your quarter pounder. There's a deal for everyone at McDonald's. Get one favorite like 10-piece chicken McNuggets, a quarter pounder, or a Big Mac and get another for just a buck. Price and participation may vary. Valid for item of equal or lesser value. Hey, I'm Ryan Reynolds. At Mint Mobile, we like to do the opposite of what Big Wireless does. They charge you a lot, we charge you a little. So naturally, when they announced they'd be raising their prices due to inflation, we decided to deflate our prices due to not hating you. That's right. We're cutting the price of Mint Unlimited from $30 a month to just $15 a month. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month slows. Full terms at mintmobile.com. And now for Rebecca's favorite part of the show, a little something we like to call... The crime of the week. Well, speaking of gentlemen thieves, a man had his bank robbery conviction thrown out after the New Jersey Supreme Court determined the state went too far during closing arguments. In 2014, Damon Williams passed a note to the teller asking, please, for the 150s and 20s, and thank you. A key legal point was, even if he didn't show a weapon, whether he threatened the teller, which is the difference between second-degree robbery and third-degree theft. Well, to make her point that actions speak louder than words, the prosecutor showed the jury a photo of Jack Nicholson in The Shining, the one with his face in the door saying, Here's Johnny! She was trying to prove that sometimes benign statements can be threatening. Well, the defense objected, noting that Nicholson said the famous line after smashing the door with an axe trying to kill his family, which was far more violent than passing a polite note at the bank. Well, the court agreed, saying the photo amounted to prosecutorial misconduct and unduly prejudiced the jury. Williams will get a new trial. In the meantime, that prosecutor will have to spend the rest of the winter caretaking an abandoned hotel in the Colorado Rockies. All work and no play. Uh, so, panel, this may not be the first time this prosecutor used such a trick in what other trial did she use Hollywood to make a point? Laura Bricker? Oh, God. Kevin, I have no answer for this. I have no idea. Toby, can you go first? Toby Ball? 
uh, it, when when she screamed at the judge, you can't handle the truth? Yes. Oh, that's a good one, Toby. Wow. You got to think about Jack. <laughs> Jack's yeah. got, yeah. <laughs> Something about Chinatown. I, Told the defense, don't don't worry about it. It's it's Chinatown. It's Chinatown. Stuck a, a knife up her nose, oh. or <laughs> yeah. Ow. I think it was the homicide case where she kept calling it red rum, red yes. rum. <laughs> See, we're on the we're on the right wavelength. <laughs> it's, all, it's all about really Jack being creepy. Yeah, Laura, maybe you can contribute in a different way. Do we have a cat of the week? <laughs> Actually, and I'm sorry that Rebecca's not here because this is a first and I'm, I was hoping that she would hear about this. We have a baby of the week. What? You mean like what? a human? Yes. So oh, man, we've just opened the door. Oh, my is, God, Laura. Yeah. No, no. So uh, nephew of the week. No, <laughs> no. This is so Wednesday. I, I put a post up in the Brichter scale and I said, boy, it's a big relief today, people. How's everybody how are you all marking the day? And people were all like, oh, I'm drinking mimosas for breakfast. Oh, I'm doing this or that. And Katie Katsikas sounded and said, actually, I'm in the hospital and I'm nine centimeters dilated Whoa, and I'm what? giving birth. And Katie continued to come on <laughs> and sound in on the Facebook post. And then we later received confirmation and the happy news. She had just given birth to Hayden Robert Carr. During the inauguration. So I felt like that wow. was... Uh, <laughs> Where was the Facebook Live, Katie? What the fuck? <laughs> we did have a video. In for a penny, in for a pound. Come on. No Facebook Live. We had a bit video of Hayden. Almost made me want to have another baby, but I think I'll get another cat. So congratulations, Katie. I can't believe... What a day. Inauguration, giving birth, and being on Facebook in the midst of it. Wow. So Laura Bricker, <laughs> if other people want to... Uh, send their labor pains to you over the socials. How can they get a hold of you? They can find me at Laura Bricker, and I'll just make a note. I will post on our Crime Hunters on Discussion group. We got a great recommendation last week, a dog that is a foster dog that needs a home, and I will put that information up on our Crime Hunters on Discussion group. Cool. Toby Ball, people want to talk about how uh, many centimeters dilated they are. <laughs> Where can they find you? <laughs> they can find me at, at Toby Ball NH. And you can follow Rebecca on Twitter or Instagram at Reb Lavoie. You can also follow the show on Twitter at Crime Writers On. I'm at Kevin P. Flynn. For some reason, she doesn't write it in the script. Uh, and I encourage you to enjoy the amazing community in our official Crime Writers On Facebook discussion group. We also have a regular old Facebook page, by the way. You can support this show on Patreon.com slash Partners in Crime Media. And you'll get the Crime Writers On After Show, Married with Podcast. The Toby Balls Deep Dive Book Club Podcast and Laura Bricker's Leave It to Bricker Podcast. Our theme music was composed and performed by Ty Gibbons. Our line editor is the very handsome Olivia Burdett. Our executive producer is Kevin Flynn and the host, and I'm doing everything this week and still getting paid the same. That's this show was right. recorded in the yoga loft above the bodega in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi studio, otherwise known as Studio C, the closet in our basement where we steal all of the jewels. Just like they do in Lupin. That's stupid. <laughs> that's incredible. That. That's incredible. Oh, that's great. On behalf of all the crime writers, thanks so much for listening. We'll catch you later. Rebecca just requested the bowl for, for next to the bed. Oh, God. Oh, my gosh. When you Poor were little, Rebecca. did you guys have the bowl, which is really just a mixing bowl? Yeah. Will had the bowl. We had to get a special, like, rug shampoo or vacuum for Will when he was little. What is that? Because, well, so he, up until a couple of years ago, he would just, like, if there was something he wanted to eat that he liked, he would just keep eating and eating and eating. Yeah. So, like, Boy Scout camp. The kids were like, hey, Will, eat all these churros. The kids last year ate 30 of them. And he's like, okay. And then he just pukes in the middle of the night. Ugh. So we went through this for, like, years with this. <laughs> That's like a real, you know, good mom trick thing that gets passed down. You know, here's the bowl. And then, and then yeah, the next week I'm going to make corn muffins in this. <laughs>
Business in Crime, crime media. media. The friendship is sharing deal. Because I want one of your McNuggets. And I need some of your quarter pounder. There's a deal for everyone at McDonald's. Get one favorite like 10 piece chicken McNuggets, a quarter pounder, or a Big Mac and get another for just a buck. Price and participation may vary. Valid for item of equal or lesser value.